Now, Talk Real Estate, sponsored by Boston Connect Real Estate Services. Hi, I'm Shara McNamara, and you are listening to Talk Real Estate. Let me share a little bit about my background before we get started. I am the broker owner of Boston Connect Real Estate, located on the South Shore, and I have been working as a full-time realtor and sales and marketing consultant for home buyers and home sellers for the past 15 years. I have helped hundreds of clients throughout the home buying and home selling process. My unique approach to assisting my clients to the next chapter of their lives is driven by being a team player and by offering them continuous training, education, advising, and mentoring. I like to say that I offer my clients exceptional service that moves you. Every week, I will be providing you with real estate topics ranging from home buyer and home seller advice, legal matters, insurance binders, flood insurance concerns, home inspection questions, environmental worries like radon, lead paint, and mold, mortgages and loan programs, staging tips and ideas, real estate contracts, market trends, home values, and more. It's a talk radio show, and sometimes we are even interactive, so you can follow along online. If you have any questions during the show, please call 781-837-4900. We'd love to talk real estate. If you missed any of our shows, or if you want to listen to one again, you can listen on my podcast at talkrealestateradio.com. If you would like a one-on-one consultation with me regarding your home sale or your home purchase, I'd love the opportunity to meet with you. You can connect with me anytime at bostonconnect.com or 781-826-8000. Now, sit back, relax, take good notes, and let's talk real estate. Hello to all my social Shore neighbors. This is Sharon McNamara, and you are, of course, listening to Talk Real Estate with Boston Connect Real Estate's uh, broker team. We're here tonight. Uh, we all are of us. the broker team. We are the broker team, and we're sounding crisp and clear. I love that. We have Ben back in the studio. Uh, he is manning the phones for us there tonight and taking care of all the switches. We have myself. We have Melissa's over there putting everybody on Facebook, so you can find us on Facebook. Uh, we have Mary here. We have Hello. one of our favorite guests. We have Stephen Cook from Imperial. Hi. How are you? Excellent. excellent. Can we hear you okay? So we just have to adjust your microphone maybe a little bit because I can't hear him in that mic, but we will take care of that. One, two, one, two. Yeah. Hmm. There we go. All right. So we can hear Ben. Everybody all good with our checks? I think if we can put our guest up a little bit more, we should be good to go. All right, that sounds great. So uh, we have Steve Cook again from Imperial uh, Inspection Services. How are you? I'm doing well. I don't yeah. get to see you that often anymore. No. I see him all the time. Mary yeah, does Mary, Mary does. does. Yes. Mary does all the work now, it seems. So I don't get to actually uh, spend time with you. You don't that, get to do the fun stuff anymore. I know. I get all the, I get all the fun stuff. But Mary loves the crawl spaces with the I, spiders. You know. And the mold. Know. I'm just not a fan of, like, you know, mouse or mice being yeah. flung at me. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. That's the only one. Yeah, well, we had Ehrlich here today, and they found a mouse here. And you know what the reason was? He's like, I found out how your mice are getting in. And I said, how? And he said, um, the dehumidifier that you have, and you have the hose going underneath the um, underneath the door. Right. He's like, they're sneaking in through there. Yep. Don't they have, like, no spine? Not spines, <laughs> but they have spineless. Collapse- <laughs> no, they have collapsible spines, so they can fit through, like, right, a tiny... They're malleable. Yeah. They can sneak right through the size of a dime. Yeah. Well, my friend Ben, we were talking about it. Ben was here uh, this week, and he was teaching me some stuff about my recorder. And he had told me, um, you can put some peppermint uh, on cotton balls, peppermint essential oils on cotton balls. That is correct. And you just sort of throw them around, and the uh, rodents apparently don't like that. So Mm. they scatter, and you don't kill them. Not that I care about that. I let Ben think I did, but I don't. (laughs) It's a polite way of saying kindly get out. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they'll grow to like true. peppermint and then they'll kind of raise their families. And Yeah, I yeah. know. Oh, yeah. Then and we'll have peppermint loving mice. That's right. <laughs> you know, they'll evolve. I love peppermint, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. I love peppermint. Can I ask a weird question? No question is weird. Go, go shoot me with your best shot. Why do they give you a peppermint when you leave restaurants? Is it just to like freshen your breath? Yeah. It's just so, polite. Is it? Just polite? Well, Probably from all the, all the garlic that you ate. <laughs> oh, here I'm thinking it's because you've been drinking wine all night and they don't want <laughs> you to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we I never just always wondered. It. I was like, oh, this is a nice little candy. Okay, mm. interesting. Yeah. It's, I like when you go to places and they give you a little, like, Andy's candy mint or something mm-hmm. after dinner, like with your bill. Yep. Do they I do? I haven't been to a place like that in a while. Where do they do that? I feel like it's like a Longhorn or a Roadhouse. I think it's a Longhorn. Yeah, Longhorn. Or I think it might be Olive Garden. Olive I, Garden? Yeah, ah. I remember seeing it 
a little yeah. Andy's Mint. I've been there once, and we have Melissa joining us. Hello, Melissa. Hello. So Melissa was just getting us all uh, up to date on Facebook. Oh, do you see the no-no I'm doing? Yeah. I, uh, my big cup of tea on our board here. Sorry about that, Ben. I'll pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> I know. Well, you might be able to see us. We're on Facebook. Yeah, Ben, I need you to log on to Facebook. See if you like this angle. We tried a little different so you can see all of us in the shot. So Be happy to do that um, right after traffic. All right. Well, that sounds great. I know we are waiting for our one and only Lisa DeMilo so she can give us a little update. Um, are we ready for her yet? No? Oh, we're no, ready. I think I... Oh, we are ready and ready as is. And she's always ready for us. So, Lisa, how's it looking out there? Well, Sharon, you guys are making me hungry. <laughs> but uh, mint. if you're... Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, you're in the thick of it on the expressway southbound. It's a grind from the tunnel down to South Bay. You're back in it from Furnace Brook to the split. Northbound's just slow approaching the tunnel. Route 3 South, that's backed up a bit coming off the expressway. The Sagamore and the Morn are both moving along, but Route 24 South is just slow coming down from 93. This report is sponsored by Compassion International. You can change the world for a child in extreme poverty through Compassion International. Just text child to 83393 to find out how. Traffic on the nines every morning. I'm Lisa DeMilo in the WATD Traffic Center. We now return to Talk Real Estate, sponsored by Boston Connect Real Estate Services on 95.9 WATD. And we are back. Hello again to all of our listeners. You are listening to Talk Real Estate with, uh, I was gonna, I wanted to say Sharon McNamara, broker team, but I know we're supposed to be getting out of that. <laughs> so <laughs> um, my name is Melissa Wallace. I'm here with Sharon McNamara, Mary Baker, and our one and only uh, our favorite inspector. Oh, thank you. Steve Cook. <laughs> we're not shy about saying well, that. We're not, even, we're not shy about saying <laughs> one and only either. Yeah. Are there other inspectors out there? I don't know. There's not, a couple of them. There are, but you're our, you're our favorite. But if you have any uh, questions regarding real estate, please call us at the studio, 781-837-4900. If you want to hear any of our past shows, you can connect with us on Facebook. Um, you can find us um, there and on Instagram, Boston Connect Real Estate, or you can go to talkrealestateradio.com. So tonight, um, I, ex I asked Steve if he would join us. I don't even know. Oh, I called you because I sent you a picture. Actually, Michelle, that was that it let you in today. Yeah. She was the agent who had that. Uh, remember oh, the heat pump the heat bar, bar or whatever, heat or whatever, whatever it was. was. Yes. We couldn't figure it out. So, but I said, hey, you want to be on the show with us this week? And then I think it was just yesterday. I said, can we talk about environmental hazards? Or oh, was that even right. this nope, morning? You sent me a text. Uh, yeah. It was this morning. They oh. said sure. It was right before I called Rob Hackler. It was right around three thirty in. in the morning, but that was okay. <laughs> I know. She doesn't sleep very much. <laughs> That's when I have my best thoughts. So um, we've talked about this in the past, but I think it's really important for us. To to sort of get caught up. Uh, Mary added something new to our list. So you're going to um, be proud of me. Yeah, Ooh. she came up with Chimneys? something new. No. no. <laughs> uh, well, I guess that isn't it. Smoke is an environmental hazard in and of itself. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. This one is a good one. So we are going to be discussing environmental hazards. So things to think about when you're buying a house. But even if you're not buying a house, we want you to think about you know, if you're in your home, you certainly want to be aware of these things that are going potential on. Potential issues. Yeah, potential issues because you might be selling your house down the road, but again, they are hazardous, so we want to make sure. So just for a quick screenshot, radon, mold, lead paint. Lead paint. <laughs> I didn't know where you are going with that. Asbestos. 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 Yeah. And then the one that Mary's going to throw into the mix, so we'll give you time to sort of think about it because I'm not sure if you know about it. I never heard of it. Vermiculite insulation. Oh, yes. And we have a uh, link on our website talking about Is that uh, good? vermiculite. You got it. Is that you, yeah, well uh, no, you oh. is completely different. That's uh, formaldehyde insulation. Oh, okay. Yep. I, I got well, my formaldehyde. They don't use up. that anymore. Well, they don't use vermiculite anymore either. But UFI, isn't it like when it was put in? Okay, well, I'm getting, jumping ahead of myself. Nope. UFI yeah. is urea formaldehyde insulation. That's what the acronym is, uh, stands for. It was a type of foam insulation that they installed back about 20 years ago. Yeah. And the stuff was great as long as it was applied properly. And what the applicators found is by adding more formaldehyde to the mix, they could stretch the product and increase the profit potential on that. Gotcha. And thus, you know, they were given mm -hmm. a high formaldehyde count inside the home. And there used to be companies that came out and just, you know, tested the formaldehyde, but it's been long, so long it's uh, dissipated now. It's just that's, the okay, that's stigma attached when we do find Eufy in the house. It's just a stigma attached to us saying, oh, you got Eufy. Yeah, I yeah. got you. That's, that's what I thought. So it's not really dangerous at this point. 
because it's it's effects have worn off, right? That's if, what they say in the testing firms okay. that did test it stopped testing mm. about ten years ago. Yeah, and I also okay. heard too though that if there was ever a fire, that there yeah. could be some some uh, hazardousness that would come back though if there was a fire. Is that? Just something I heard. Yeah, it's just stuff, you know, stuff burning, like you know, roofing on the house or yeah. you know, paint, lead paint oh. inside the home. Any of that stuff, when it catches fire, it gives mm-hmm. off. It just goes into the air yeah. and toxins and right. Right, and it's some, sometimes like the manufactured homes when they have a fire on those, those little stars that hold the boards together, oh. while the weight those fling off during oh, the fire really? and. Uh, they act like little like. Yeah. Star, yeah. Uh, yep. star things that people throw at each other. Don't what you is know? that star? Um, I know what you're talking about. Like, not yeah. a shooting star. I don't know. What's it the called? Points? Yep. Yeah, it's all the little points on it. What's it called? I know, it's not a shooting star, for sure. Yeah, all right. Well, we have to catch up on some of our kung fu movies or something. <laughs> Did you say five points on it? Yes. Yeah. Pentacle. Oh. Not to be confused oh, with pentagram, not, which is the not good one. not the word I was thinking No, these of. are the ones that the... Um, you know, if you're doing, like, the kung fu stuff, like yeah, Mary was saying. Or yeah. Oh, shurikens, throwing, throwing, throwing stars. Me. Yeah, throwing, throwing stars. stars. Throwing yeah. stars. I knew it was something star. Huh. I got all kinds of useless info. Check in later. <laughs> That's great. So why, where do you want to stop? Well, first of all, Steve, for the people who are driving home tonight, um, if you have any questions, feel free to call us, 781-837-4900. Tonight's your night that you can get in any of your uh, questions for Steve when it comes to home inspection. It doesn't have to be the topic we're discussing right now. Uh, but, Steve, why don't you tell our listeners, not that everybody doesn't know who you are, yeah. a little bit about who you are and your the areas that you service. Sure. We, uh, the areas that we cover is basically you know, right down to the islands, up to Boston and Toward Lexington that way, and then down to the. I uh, can't believe you go to Lexington. Rhode Island, yeah, Rhode, Rhode Island build, you know, Rhode Island, Rhode Island uh, border down there, and I've been inspecting homes. I started in August of 1982. Wow! That's when I did my first one. I, I heard that you afraid. have one of the earliest license numbers. Like, what are you I number do, four? I am number four. Yes. Oh, look yeah. at that! Yep. Wow. Wow. I'm number four. Yep. Um, wow. Which it means like he's an OG. He's an OG inspector. <laughs> Old goat? Old goat. No. No, no, no I like that. Old goat. Let's, let's go with that. Original gangster. Oh, I mean, okay. you, can, you, can be, you can be the goat of inspectors. Right. You can be the old goat of inspectors if you want to. Right, right. But they started licensing for home inspectors in uh, 2002. You know, mm-hmm. prior to that, print up a business card and sight unseen. You can go out there really? and do what you, you know, want to do. It's pretty It's pretty intense right now, though. I mean, what? I mean, how many hours do you need and you need on-hands experience, right? Right. You have to do 125 fee-based paid inspections hmm. to be considered for your license. And you have to pass the national exam. And then you have to get uh, 80 hours of um, formal training through a trainer or through a school. Mm-hmm. And those are the criteria that you have to meet. And it usually takes about a year, year and a half to get your license. I think that they should make the regulations to be a real estate agent a little more strict as mm-hmm. well. Because mm-hmm. I feel like too many people can just you just get your license after, what is it, how many hours? 40 hours. Before, when I got my license, it was only 24. Me too. My broker's yeah. license as well. But just think about that. 40 hours of class time. So you can do that in a week. And then you take the test. And now you're a real estate agent. And you can can just really go anywhere and it matters on what company you choose like how much training you're going to get and right. and you're working with thousands and thousands of dollars mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of dollars and not only that like situations like this i mean we're so well versed in what we do because of you right right so i think that there should be more um about that we're actually that's going to be our topic next week actually is so you want to be a real estate agent uh and we're going to have a little discussion about that next week right but most of your brokers they always hang with me during the inspection they learn something they mm-hmm. ask questions mm-hmm. so. and you that's know the best part for me yeah. i love Sorry. it Sorry no that's okay off. You don't have to cut me off. This is a radio show. We all talk. <laughs> to talk real estate show. But one of the things is um, the house in Bridgewater. It's funny because I've been doing this for so long. I've been working with you for so sure. long. I'm now in the process of, you know, my buyer clients selling that first house. And it's funny, like, going through the inspections now when the buyer comes through with their inspector. A lot of times it's not you. Sometimes it is. But things will come up, and I'll say, oh, that Steve brought that up in the initial home inspection when they had their home right. inspection. You know, so it's good to know that Yeah, some just have a knowledge base, and some things they are problematic and need to be dealt with in a uh, mm-hmm. certain amount of time. Yep. And buyers are looking for what's wrong, not for what's right. So right. that's what we are there for, too. Yeah. And everything can be fixed. It's just zeros on a check, I always mm-hmm. tell people. Yeah. yeah, sometimes more than others, but... But you're not allowed to tell anybody, like, oh, this will probably cost you about... 
No, that's one of the prohibitions uh, since 2002 for the licensing for home inspectors. We're not allowed to get in the pricing at all. Mm-hmm. You know, it's actually... Well, I think that's really smart, though. Mm. I don't think you should be throwing out any numbers. No, because there's always two ways of fixing it. Sometimes yeah. the buyer will want something replaced where the you know the seller allows us. Geez, I can have my uncle come in and they can fix that and you can get some more time out of it. Oh, yeah. You know, so as a buyer, you want something that's long-term and mm-hmm. they just want something to... Get Buyer to the closing walking around and, and exactly. you say it's twenty thousand dollars to fix, and then they're going right back and being like, "Oh, it's twenty thousand dollars. Take it off the exactly. sale." Exactly. Mm-hmm. That way, if something's you know? wrong with the house, then you bring someone in that does that type of work. Yeah. And you get real twenty twenty prices, and then you can get: is it going to be a repair or is it going to be a replacement? And, mm-hmm. and then that's where you guys get paid the big bucks to. Yeah. Oh yeah, to go back and forth. Be the intermediary, you say, "Go back and forth." You got it. Well, and that's why I think the buyers, like the buyers, always want it done, but done a different way. Like a good example, I don't have an actual example but maybe Mary you do but I'll just make up one uh, something's wrong with the kitchen counter it isn't attached to the cabinets and they want the the counter replaced well they don't want just laminate now they want granite right right you know mm-hmm. what I mean they always want the best of the best yeah. and I and I can agree with that but I don't think that the seller should be you know I come from a seller point of view most of the time um, I want to um, I don't want my seller to spend that money. Right, yeah. but I've seen people, you know, negotiate a doorbell that doesn't work. You know, so it's all up to the. You know, you ask I don't the seller, want a doorbell. I want good old-fashioned knocking. There you go. Knock, knock, um, knock. We have a great door knocker here. Speaking of knocking on our doors, we have a caller. He's JT, um, and he's on the phone. He's got a question. I don't know if it's for us or for Steve, but sure. JT, are you, there? are you there? Yes, I am. How are you? Hey, good. JT. How are you? Doing all right. Hey, I've got a question for you, uh, for the inspector. Um, my wife and I live in a townhouse, and what happens is during the deep freezes in the winter, no matter what we do in order to keep our water from, freeze, from freezing in the kitchen, uh, we keep our, uh, our faucet uh, dripping a little uh, during the day and during the night during the deep freeze, as well as we... Um, as well as we keep our our cabinets underneath our kitchen sink open, and still our dishwasher freezes. Um, I was told by our plumber that it's more of an insulation issue, and because of because it's a townhouse, um, we have to go through our board in order to have insulation um, go in from the outside, or else it's going to cost us a lot of money if we do the insulation from the inside if insulation needs to be added. Um, what are your thoughts on yeah. adding insulation or what else should we be looking at? Probably your first thing is probably when you get someone with what they call a FLUR, and that's like an infrared uh, machine, and they can place it on the outside of the house or on the inside, uh, and that's a camera, and it actually tells you if there's any air infiltration coming into the home and where it's coming from, and sometimes you can pinpoint it from there and just insulate a small area or a large area. And then the other is if this is a chronic problem, you can always add uh, automatic heat tape to it. And that will, it's a, almost looks like an extension cord that wraps around the actual pipe. And that plugs into mm-hmm. an outlet. And that will sense the temperature and turn on and off automatically. Or you can buy one that you can you know manually turn on. The, uh, the, the pipe that we have is, um, it's, Behind the wall, it's like trapped in the wall be between the uh, kitchen sink and the outdoor wall. So unfortunately, that wouldn't happen. But but you said a floor? A floor, that has a floor? That's forward-looking infrared, yes. Okay. And, yeah, and so, and and so the device, uh, a lot of times, if you have an energy-saving company come in, um, <laughs> they have these type of equipment. It's small, about the size of a uh, cell phone now. And you just turn it on, and you look in the screen, and we'll tell you whether there's any air infiltration coming in or out of the home, and uh, kind of pinpoint it exactly. And is it something okay. where you can, if it's freezing, so it's freezing from the like the outside wall? Is there anything like any type of insulation you can do just underneath the pipe? Right. Like spray foam? Right. Uh, you got to find out where it's coming from first, but it sounds like someone didn't uh, insulate the wall cavity properly before they put yeah. everything together on the house and there's probably just i don't know if it's vinyl siding or mm-hmm. what type of siding that you have it could be a piece of house wrap it's that's missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be a piece of house wrap that's missing behind it mm-hmm. 
We have a plumber in the okay. house as well, JT. Yeah. So we're just uh, hooking him up with some headphones right now so he can uh, sort of oh, tune in a little bit too. Yeah, so um, I know you said that you had your own plumber there. So uh, we figured we got the thank guy you. right here. We'll just let him listen thank real quick. So Mark, Mark's just putting you. on his headphone. Hey. Mark, this is JT. How are you, JT? Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, how are you? Good and yourself. So, can you just repeat, JT, where, how this, what, what's happening to you with the freezing? He's in a condo. Yeah. Townhouse. So, we live in a townhouse, and during the deep freezes, no matter what we do to keep our dishwasher, um, especially our dishwasher, from not working during the deep freezes, we keep our kitchen sink. Um, to, to, we keep our kitchen sink dripping a little, um, as well as the as well as the doors underneath our kitchen sink open in order to let the heat in. Um, but our dishwasher and sometimes even our kitchen faucet freezes. And we were told by our plumber that it's more of a more of an insulation issue. And because we live in a townhouse, we have to go through uh, the board, unfortunately, in order to in order to see if we can get insulation um, from the outside because it would be cheaper to do it from the inside. Because if they do insulation, if they, if they install insulation from the inside, then they need to, like, uh, take apart all of our kitchen cabinets and stuff, and that would cost a lot. Yeah, that would, that would be correct. But um, is the kitchen, like, over a garage or an overhang or anything? No, it's, it's on the outside wall. It definitely sounds like an insulating problem. Right. Is there a watering spigot uh, where you hook, hook up a hose right behind that area? There is. So it could I'm be infiltrating, sure you know, the hole where the pipe, you know, enters out of the home, maybe larger than, and air could be coming in through that, too. Mm. It doesn't take much, okay. especially if you get a windy thing. Yeah, it's the, it's the drafts. The drafts yep. will freeze it instantly. So is that mm -hmm. something where he could just stick some insulation in that? If you go to your outside silcock, can he just stuff some insulation in that? It's trial by error sometimes. Yeah, yeah. If you can find the draft and stop the draft, you'd probably right. be able to stop the freezing. Mm-hmm. So okay, what so would be um, the hold up from doing it through? I can't imagine that your board would be upset about it because it sounds to me if this is a townhouse, usually when they're building houses like that, so you're side by side? Um, yes, we are side by side. So most of the units, when because we our team does a lot of new construction, every unit is usually built exactly the same. So I'd be surprised if you're the only one having that issue. Are you the only one having the issue that you know? Have you spoken with your neighbors? Um, yes, so supposedly we are the only ones. So it could have been late on Friday afternoon and they ran out of <laughs> insulation. Is it? Wrap it up, Joe. Let's get out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. See if you can up, uh, right. on the out, outside wall. Is there like a trim board on the bottom? Or is it shingle? There is, yeah. Yeah. See if you can get up underneath there and maybe just stuff some insulation up there or maybe some of that foam seal. See yep. if you can stop some of the draft. Okay. I will try that. Thank you very much. Oh, you're okay. welcome. Thank Did you have you. any other I, questions I for us tonight, show. JT? No, that's all. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Have a safe ride home, okay? I will. Thank you. You do the same. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Thanks, JT. Have a good one. Uh, so that was JT. We don't... We don't know what town he was from, but that was JT, and he had a great question. If you have any questions for Steve, we have Steve. Um, he is our home inspector, our go-to guy. Uh, he is in the house. We also have Mark from McNamara Plumbing in the house with us tonight. We have Melissa. Uh, hello, we Melissa. Got, we got a, all our guys. We got a full house, you know. but yeah. I really feel like we're just sitting at our kitchen table right now. Like, uh, if someone could pour us some wine, that would be perfect. <laughs> I'm not drinking during the week. I know. I'm <laughs> yeah. We did bring two bottles tonight. Oh, perfect. That sounds great. Great. Um, so if you have any questions, Ben is in the studio. He can uh, pipe you right over to us. Seven, no, no pun intended. 781-837-4900. So back to our topic. Uh, what do we want to start with? want to start with radon? Start yeah. off with radon? Sure. Yeah. That's fine. So we basically, with all of the things that we have, we have the same questions. Okay. So sure. here are the questions for each category that we're going to ask. What is it? Where does it come from? How dangerous is it? And how do you remediate it? Right? So well, we'll go gas, through each one. That's a natural occurring radioactive gas. And the only reason it's more prevalent today than it was, say, 40 years ago, are the houses are built so tight. Mm -hmm. You just don't have the air exchange. So if you think of like a microwave oven, you know, you put the coffee cup in there, you heat up the water, open the door, you grab the cup, 
mm-hmm. you know, you're not going to have any concerns. Mm-hmm. But with, with the house, it's just making it so tight mm-hmm. that the radon, as it comes in, it hangs around inside the home and mm-hmm. does the damage. So what are the the factors about radon that people should be concerned about? Yeah, when you test your home, they measure that in what they call pico curies. And in uh, the United States, it's 3.9 Pico curies or below is considered acceptable. Mm-hmm. It's once it hits the magic number of 4.0 or greater, that's when you want to consider putting a uh, remediation system inside. Hmm. Okay. And most remediation systems, whether it's you know 16.0 or 40.5, they'll you know pretty much guarantee it to bring it down below 2.5. And it's a pretty easy process. I mean, to put one in. Yeah, monetarily anywhere from 800 to 1500 dollars, unless they're going to yeah. do a, uh, say a two pipe system. If it's a big house, then yeah. probably another 500 dollars on top of that. Yeah. Mary, any questions? Melissa, any questions about that? No. Factors with. Um, Radon, so settlement cracks happen a lot, like in the in the basement. Sometimes right. they so happen in the foundation. Can that release more radon into the house? It or? can. It can allow uh, radon to come into the home. So if you look at a crack in the you know basement floor, say it's a sixteenth of an inch in, yeah. in width, that's like a hundred mile wide opening for radon gas to come in. Yeah, you know, probably super, super tiny. Yep. So when they do do the uh, remediation systems inside the house or the reduction systems, they seal all the cracks. And then they seal where the floor joins up with the foundation wall. Oh, all the way around. All the way around the perimeter. And then the others, if there's a sub-pump opening, they'll put a a seal cover on the top of that. Yeah, a client of ours just had that done, actually. Right. It was almost like a plexiglass cover. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, I was like, oh, how, how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. That way, when you're testing for radon, you always go more I should have had you bring a machine tonight, and you could yeah. have done here. That we would could. have been oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we could I'll have done that, that off. Yeah. Um, I had another question. So, new construction, they have these ERV fans that they have to run constantly mm-hmm. within the house now. Is that to kind of help out with radon or help out with, oops, sorry, I hit my microphone, um, help out with just circulating air into the house constantly because they are being built so tight. Yeah, that's just uh, you know, allowing the circulation of air okay. inside the home. But sometimes they can be problematic with creating radon. Oh, really? Because they create a negative oh, air pressure inside the up? home. And it's sucking it out. So your house is like a vacuum cleaner. So mm-hmm. say if you go to a person's home or friend's house during the wintertime, you open the front door, sometimes you get hit with the heat. Interesting. And sometimes the house you know, oh. draws the cold in from the outside. It all depends if you get a positive or negative home. So that creates a negative. So if radon is present in the area, it will tend to draw it more in with those type of fans. Oh, and, that's and interesting. Cre- and create a problem. So where a problem didn't exist because the house was so tight, you created one by putting something in there that was meant to help it. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. It's like then running they- like, like a whole house fan and you have a heating system and all the windows are closed. And yeah. you turn that whole house fan on, that's going to start to draw back mm-hmm. any of the exhaust going mm-hmm. out through the uh, exhaust pipe. I remember back in the foreclosure time period that we were going through, I was with a client and um, she was small and he was very big and we were going She's into talking about height. The yeah, height. That's what I figured. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. By height wise. I mean, he was just a, he was a big, big guy and she was like little, little petite. And we were going into one of these homes that was a foreclosed property and no one had been in it for a very long time. And I went in first because I, you know, had the key, the lockbox and everything. And when I opened it up, that negative pressure thing that you were just talking about, I got smacked in the face with right. mold, spore, spores. And he was behind me and he was really tall and she was behind him, the two of us got so sick. I've never had a sinus infection quite like that in my life. And now I'm super sensitive to the mold. Right. So that negative pressure thing is real. Right. We have that sometimes on the home inspections on some of the stuff that's been shut up for a while. We go in there and a lot of times it doesn't bother me, but all of a sudden I'll get home, I'll, I'll call mm. the broker. Did you get sick on that house? Oh, yeah. I did. Yeah, I've been, you know, sneezing. And, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Knock well, on wood, I haven't gone into any of those yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have. We had one in Duxbury with the oh, bank owned. Remember? True, and you true, true, went true. down there and you're like, Sharon, don't even bother coming down here. Like, you won't last a minute. But one of the other things that I'm noticing or I've seen, so one of my builders has done it in the past. So they're trying to be proactive and they're like, oh, I'm going to put in the pipe already for radon. So like it's underneath and they have the pipe just sitting in the <laughs> in the basement, but they don't cap it. So what they do is just bringing that radon right into the house. Right. Unless they put a passive system in, meaning taking that pipe and going all the way back up to the roof mm-hmm. and having the pipe exit. And that's kind of like a uh, passive system yep. that's inside the home. And if it does become 
you know, a problem where it's above 4.0, you know, people are curious, they can install a fan yeah. with that and, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, say 50% of the mitigation system is already installed. Yeah. Well, this one here is just the pipe is just there. There you go. There's your pipe. If you mm-hmm. ever have read on, you can do something about it. It's like, well, you bring read on in. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right, interesting. Mel, any questions for Steve regarding radon? Um, not on radon. Okay. I, I feel like we've had some good conversations about radon. <laughs> I'm feeling, <laughs> feeling pretty confident yep. about it. I have a whole script in my head that I've learned from Steve, so when I explain it to people, I'm like, channeling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the one home inspection I ever did was with you in Marshfield, and I just remember when we went down into the basement, I was like, oh, I can explain this to them because I <laughs> <laughs> it is um it is a learning experience i mean when you're doing inspections for people it isn't just to tell them bad news it's right. to teach them about the house as well right right yeah you know, where the main shutoffs is you know all mm-hmm. that type of stuff but we're mainly there to let them know what's wrong with the house yeah rather than what's uh, right with the property mm-hmm. absolutely i heard you say that to a client recently too and it was one of the first times i ever like keep in mind, this right. is this is what I'm here for. Sometimes you go into for. a troubled home, and I'm yeah. just sitting there, and the first twenty things like, I look at, eighteen are broken, yeah. and the other two don't, you know, they don't work. I'm not <laughs> here to make you feel warm and fuzzy. Got to get a starting point. We'll jack up the key and uh, <laughs> work around it. Um, again, if you have any questions for us, you can even uh, if you're on Facebook and you're watching us, hello to everybody there. Uh, you can send us a question through uh, Facebook, and we'll be sure to answer it that way. But you can also call Ben at the studio eight three seven. Uh, 4900, that's area code 781-837-4900. Mel, what is our next one that we should talk to Steve about? We are going to be talking about lead paint. So again, same questions. What is it? Where does it come from? How dangerous is it? And how do you remediate it? Uh, Lead paint, you generally find that in houses that are built uh, prior to 1978. And the way that they test for it is what they call an XRF. And it's an x-ray machine. And when you fire it up, you place it on the surface um, and it will read up through 20 layers of paint without damaging anything. Oh, 20 layers. Yeah. And in Massachusetts, uh, the action level is 1.0. So anything 0.9 on the machine or lower, that's considered a septal amount of lead. And most of the machines read, you know, 0 to 9.9. Mm-hmm. So once it hits that 1.2, 1.3 or more, that's considered elevated lead. And dependent where it's located is how they uh, remediate it. Mm-hmm. And we know on your website, you have a link right to the state website where you can check. Mary and I went and did a CMA uh, analysis for somebody recently, and it's an older home. And they're like, well, you know, we don't know if there's lead paint or not. You know, it's an old house. Right. We're figuring that there is. And it was like, well, you can't just assume that there is. So Mary went right online and went to the state registry and, you know, looked up the house. And there, there was nothing recorded right. that there was. So so it's never been professionally tested. So anytime that we do do a uh, lead paint inspection, whether it be a full one or a lead determination, uh, mm-hmm. once it's all said and done, we have to file the cover sheet with the state, and then they log that into the uh, Massachusetts database. So say two, three years down the road, you know, someone wants to find out if the house has ever been tested, if documentation mm-hmm. and stuff got lost, uh, they can look it up there, find out who the inspector is, and see if they can get a uh, copy of the report. Nice. And we did a whole show on just lead paint, so that's something that we can do maybe in the spring, right. too, is just talk about lead paint because there's so many nuances that go along with that. And the and regulations, new regulations changed, right? And the regulations yeah. changed in December of 2017, so now they go more toward the intact standard rather than abating things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's, you know, all these other regulations, too, with, like, if you have a garage and if even if it's detached and everything else, right? There's just so Right. Much. If it's a detached garage, just the outside of the garage needs to be brought into compliance. Mm-hmm. But if it's an attached garage and it has, you know, a passageway into the home, then the interior of the garage you know, has, has to be treated be like a room. Okay. Right. I know Mary was talking about your machine the other day, and yep. I was like, and I think she said it was, like, $15,000 or something for that machine. How Pretty much. much. Right around there. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, really expensive. Goes along with it, and then about every 15 months, you need to have it uh, recharged. Uh, our new radioactive source put in it, and that's right around 2,500 to 3,000 really? dollars. Yeah. And then your radon machines. Oh, can we go back to radon for a second? Sure. Okay. I'm glad you're keeping up with me. So um, with the Not radon. Really. I got my crib notes down below. <laughs> well, it's so funny because Mary's like, Steve's just so cool like a cucumber out there. And we're like running around trying to get ready for the show. I go, he has been doing this with me for a long time. Mm-hmm. He's very used to it. Um, but I think it's really important. We always suggest to our clients that they use the machine versus the canisters. Right. 
And one of the rules or policies for Boston Connect Real Estate is, is I don't allow our buyer agents, our agents who work as buyer's agents or seller's agents, to go to the house and pick up those little kits and put right. it all together. I just feel like he who held it last is responsible. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? You don't know if you're putting it together. You know, I'm not a chemist or a scientist, even though it's just putting caps on. Not my responsibility. Right. But I really like the machine. So can you tell the difference between, tell us and our listeners the difference between the two? Right. There's a couple different ways. One, you can do it is electronically and we use a, um, it's a radon machine and you basically place it in the home and it has to stay a minimum 48 hours. And what it does is collect the data on one hour intervals. So when you come back after the 40 hour, 48 hour placement, you plug either a laptop or a portable printer into it. It will, you know, uh, read out the actual uh, test period and we'll give you 48 plus results on there. Mm -hmm. So if someone cheats or <laughs> does something or opens a window or touches a unit where it reads one hour, you know, at one hour increments on there, there'll be a symbol next to it, either T, meaning they tampered with it, or P if they unplugged the unit. Mm. And all of a sudden, say if the um, readings are consistent, uh, 2.6, 2.5, all of a sudden zero, 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 zero. <laughs> you know, someone opened the door what is up. What wrong and, with people? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I have a story, but... Right. And then the other is you can you can test it with the cans. Both the cans and the machines, as long as the machines are properly cal calibrated and mm -hmm. taken care of, and even the uh, charcoal canisters, uh, they both give you a good reading. Mm -hmm. But you know with the with the charcoal cans, um, once they're set inside the home. Uh, they need to be picked up, sealed, put in the mail, and they get sent to the lab. Mm -hmm. With the machine, you get the results right on site. With the uh, canisters, you just got to wait a couple of days. But both mm -hmm. are, you know, EPA approved methods. But I also think that it's so easy to tamper. Like I like that you can see. Not that I don't trust people, but yeah. uh, you know, I don't know the sellers when we're working yeah. as buyers agents. Right. You know, uh, we had the situation. I know I've talked about it over and over. So I'm sorry, people, if you've heard me say this. But Steve looked at me one time and he's like, they unplugged it. I go, how yeah. do you know? And he's like, uh, because it says it. It says ba battery backup or something. Right, right. <laughs> right? Yep. So, yeah. It tells you the exact hour and uh, yeah. what has happened down there. And I then, think we got kicked out right. afterwards, right? Yeah, and it gets us into a tough situation because we can't validate the readings. Now they become invalid. And this, mm -hmm. she's going to test it again. It says, who's going to pay for it a second time? For that, yeah. And that always becomes a sticking point. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It should be the person who cheated that should pay for exactly, it. Exactly, but you never can accuse anybody of doing anything. You can only tell them this is what happened during the test. And They told us that yeah. their child unplugged it. Right. I was like, why was your five-year-old playing with a plug? Right. Hmm. Now yeah. we have bigger issues. <laughs> <laughs> right, and it's not like we just put the machine inside the house. It's big orange tags that say, oh, cautious, yeah. radon test, do not touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and then we put tags on the windows, do not open the windows. and Yeah. Actually, can we have a couple of those? I'd sure. like to have a couple we'll of give those. give a couple before we leave tonight. All right, perfect. I think that that's just something good for us to educate our sellers on as well. This is so, what it looks like. Hey, you know, just so you know, when after the home inspection, you might see something like this. Right. Just so we can talk about that. You looked like you were ready to ask a question. I have, so that actually, a very similar um, situation happened Nine recently. Nine minutes. I know. So I, d I didn't want to say it. I was going to say it off air. But um, we got inconclusive results from a radon test, and it was for no other reason than Scott, who is your residential rad radon guy, got it. Um, came in and he, you know, was the homeowner was there and kind of waiting for us to give him the result. And I could tell because Scott's very friendly with me and right. he wasn't saying anything. So I'm like, something's not right. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But I was like, okay, I'll talk to your agent and I'll get back to you soon. Right. Um, and we walked outside. That and means goes, a concern is there. Yeah, yeah, he goes, I can tell that these these results are inconclusive. Like I can't say what happened because there's no way we go from a super high reading like 6.0, 6.5, right. 7, 8, 9, and then a couple hours later we're down to 1, 0, 0.2. Right. He goes, that's just not how fluctuations work. Um, so yeah, we had to, that was a hurdle we had to get through. Um, but Because then they'll go on the internet when you go to set it a second time, they'll find out how to yeah. Defeat, defeat it again on it because it mm -hmm. can be defeated and it's like the uh, cans that you talk about you can put a book on the top of them mm -hmm. tip them upside down and put a couple drops of water in them and that will uh, skew the results on them yeah well so it's just it's a slippery slope I've never yeah. had that happen before and he's just like I, 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 it's just inconclusive yeah. I'm we not could, accusing anybody usually but about it's once, one a month that's, that's, really yeah. that's never happened I to me. hate that phone call oh and you know it, we just let everybody know how to tamper yeah. <laughs> so now everybody knows how to wreck them so but I just think 
you're buying a house. So like I said earlier, hundreds of thousands of dollars to purchase a home. I say, you know, what's the difference with price? Do you mind even saying on air? Like oh, between no. the canister and the machine? Uh, well, you don't do the canister, but canisters are usually right around 80 to $100 and yep. the machine is 175 mm -hmm. uh, But the 175 that includes uh, pickup and uh, yep. setup on there. Perfect. Usually what the canister is, uh, they usually set it during the home inspection and then mm -hmm. it's up to the buyer Somebody to else, find yeah. someone to retrieve it and put it in the Yeah, mail. missing work and doing right. things like that. Yeah. I think it's worth the extra hundred dollars or whatever it is because right. you know you have the most accurate information and you know it's being calibrated and you're doing it the right way. Right. So. We cal calibrate the machines once a year plus we are mm -hmm. uh, licensed you know, by the EPA to uh, mm -hmm. perform these tests. All right, perfect. Um, do you guys want to talk about how it's a disclosable item? Yeah, we can discuss that. Yeah, so you want to take it? You want to take it? What do you want? Do you want to do it? No. I'm asking you guys. Oh. <laughs> so one of the things is is when you're a listing agent and then the buyer comes in and does the inspection, it will if it comes back with high rate on. The seller really is in a predicament where it's like, okay, you're going to spend the, I've never seen one over $1,200. Are you going to spend the money to just get it remediated? The buyer's going to be happy. Um, you know, it's a second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking, um, you know, to have it done. If not, it is something that we do have to disclose after the fact. So if that buyer decides not to go forward because you wouldn't put in the mitigation system, we do have to then let people know we did get a high read on right. reading. An elevated one or a high yeah. reading. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. really, all of these that were all of these environmental hazards that we're talking about do end up being disclosable items. So right. if they mm -hmm. aren't taken care of and or if somebody was trying to hide them, not that we would ever do that, but if it's a for sale by owner or something like that, these are this is information that a buyer has the right to know and right. we have an obligation as real yeah. estate um, agents to tell them. Mm -hmm. And then when we're talking about lead paint, I remember one time um, somebody, I had a, a home and it was an antique and the lead paint, the buyer did a lead paint test and it came back negotiate how that was going to be, you know, taken care of because the seller doesn't have to. They do not. No. But the buyer, if they're going to be moving in with somebody under the age of seven, right? Six. Six? Under the age of six? Then it becomes their responsibility yeah. to bring it into compliance. Exactly. Yep. So the sell, they couldn't come to terms with that. But then I said, well, I have to disclose now that you have lead paint. And they were like, well, we don't want you to do that. And I was like, I legally have to. And they said, no, we don't want you to do that. So I, I had to quit. Right. Because I'm not willing to lie for somebody. I'm not going to put my license on the line for somebody to lie no, like that. You. No. Right. Then somebody gets lead paint poisoning and life is not good. No. <laughs> so, um, it's a sad story. Anything else about lead paint? That, that I think that that's such a big one that we have to come back to that another right. night. Right. They're all biggies. You could spend, you know, two hours on each subject, but this I is know. a good way to touch base on each one of them, get a little bit of knowledge on it. And that's just our five minute warning. So I want to talk real quick about Mary's. We'll skip the mold because that in itself is another story. Beast. It's a beast. Yeah. So yeah. Mary, why don't you bring up the one that you were concerned about? So it's vermiculite insulation. I've only run into it once as a buyer's agent, but recently, guess who has it? You have vermiculite I in your house. Have, I yeah. have it in my attic. So I don't know much about it. Um, so if, again, what is it? If you talk to a lab that tests vermiculite, yeah. they tell you in Massachusetts that all vermiculite is to be considered asbestos. Okay, so right. it's asbestos insulation essentially. Right, because when you do send out the sample to the lab, and uh, we have a lab that's up in Woburn that does testing for that, uh, what you're testing is just that one little baggie that you're sending up there. You're not doing the whole, say, 800 square foot in the attic, so you're not getting a good sample. So they could have used different stuff, but they usually just consider it to be asbestos. Okay. You know, by sending them a uh, sample, you're just kind of confirming you mm -hmm. know, what it is. But So we had Mass Save come in, and um, they did an audit on the house, and this yep. was months ago. They went up into the attic and they said, you know, we can't do anything and we can't do anything insulation wise because our house was built in the 1800s, right. um, at least the first portion of our house. Um, and it was because we had some type of insulation and Sam calls me and he's like, we have some, That's we have some insulation and they won't touch it and they won't do anything and we can't put like AC up there. Why can't you just put something over it? It's just, it, it, it fragments and it will just kind of filter through things. So, I mean, is it dangerous for her to be living there? I mean, people have been living there since the 1800s. Yeah, it all depends on the content of asbestos that's inside of it. Okay, so it's something. And so what type of professional remediates something like an asbestos uh, removal an company? asbestos removal company. Okay. Yeah, first thing you may do is maybe get it tested by an asbestos guy. Or if you feel comfortable, there's a What does lab. it look like? 
Uh, it looks like... Um, per- I haven't gone up there. Oh, okay. It looks like uh, perlite, almost like the stuff that's in planters. Oh. And it's usually square. Okay. And it's usually, say, an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch in diameter. And it usually has, like, you know, it's all square. And it's usually gray to... I'm going to send Shining you a picture color. later. Yep, I'm going to like, stick my head up there with a mask. Right, and depending where it was mined, sometimes there's mica in it. So if you put a light on it, it will, it will uh, kind of flicker too. Interesting. Yep. So well, when do they... I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. When did they stop using that? Oh, they used it up to, say, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Mm. So yeah. what about for you, though? I mean, what about these hazards to you as an inspector? I mean, do you say, I'm not going up there based on this? or Right, if it's like, a, you know, if we're going into a crawl space and you have the white asbestos on the pipes and stuff down below or you know rodent droppings in the crawl space we don't go in there oh really because yeah. you can just see it and just say you know there you go i can see it i'm not i'm not going to go crawl right, around but, in it but if you're you know, checking for structure and termites you know just an area that's yeah kind of a hazard to go inside there okay mary um christopher chris mcnamara is licensed asbestos he, and he, oh, he works for the town of braintree for the school system but i know he's licensed so maybe you could uh talk to him one weekend or something and ask yeah, him definitely. pick his brain on it so yeah because that's sort of dangerous oh absolutely we had no idea we were uh, doesn't sound cheap to get rid of I know it's not. It's not, not getting we, central. I see. Is it over Melissa's bedroom? <laughs> no. It's our, so it's only in the. We have no attic space. Actually, the only attic space that we have is in the new addition, and the um, older portion of the house. So it's a very small surface area. Mm-hmm. Oh gosh, I've done that like four times today. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not. I'm hoping it's not going to be too bad. Right. But, but at if the you same talk time, to a professional, they kind of let you know what the exposure and mm. okay. how bad it is. Oh, what do you got to? The tent out so, back and oh yeah. So. so can I sleep upstairs? Should I not sleep upstairs? Well, Am I gonna die? Can you there. just still sleep in the You have to have a personal conversation with Steve after uh, the show because okay, we need everybody to know how they can get in touch with Steve oh. if they want to have a home <laughs> inspection. So Steve, thank you again. Again, this is Steve Cook from Imperial Inspection Services. He's the best of the best. He wouldn't be on this show with us right now if he wasn't. And uh, he's a good friend. I feel like I can say that. Um, we love having you on our Boston Connect Real Estate family team. Um, how can people get in touch with you if they need to have an inspection or have questions for you? Sure, they can reach us by calling one. 1-800-440-1141. Again, 1-800-440-1141 or Imperial Inspection Services. Perfect. And com. we can always get, get, get all this information on bostonconnect.com. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, Ben. Bye. You're welcome.